This video is brought to you by NordVPN. Give yourself options online. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash biographics or use the code biographics to grab a two-year plan for just $99. More on them in a bit. He wasn't a mob boss, he wasn't a capo or an underboss or any other high-ranking member of the Mafia. He didn't even have a gangster's name, he was just a mid-level wise guy. So then, how come Henry Hill became one of the most famous mobsters of all time? The answer to this is Goodfellas. Bartid Scorsese's iconic masterpiece hailed as one of the greatest crime movies of all time, which tells the story of Henry Hill, from his beginnings as a young thug to becoming a wise guy working for the Lucchese crime family, to testifying against his former associates and entering the witness protection program. The movie made Henry Hill famous, but there was another important aspect that made this situation unique. Goodfellas was based on the book Wise Guy, Life in a Mafia Family, a true crime account by Nicholas Pileggi, which chronicled Hill's exploits in the Mafia and presented a detailed and ruthless account of the life of a mobster told from a first-hand perspective with the help of Henry Hill himself. Unsurprisingly, the book will serve as our main source today as we bring you the story of the man who always wanted to be a gangster in order to become a somebody in a neighborhood full of nobodies. Henry Hill was born on June 11, 1943 in Brooklyn, New York, one of eight children to Henry Hill Sr. and Camilla Costa. Although his mother was Sicilian, his father had Irish heritage, and right off the bat this limited Hill's options in his criminal career. In order to rise through the ranks of the Mafia and become a made man, he needed to be a full-blooded Italian. No exceptions were made. This meant that Henry Hill could only ever be an associate, no matter how valuable or effective he proved himself to be. His fascination with the mob came from a young age. There was a cab stand right across the street from his home home, which served as a local gangster hangout. Young Henry would spend ages looking out of his window with awe at all the men who went there who were unlike everybody else in the neighborhood. They arrived at the cab stand driving long black Lincolns and Cadillacs. They wore platinum watches and diamond rings and had on big expensive coats. Henry didn't exactly know who they were, he just knew that he wanted to be like them. In 1955, when he was 12 years old, Henry took the first step towards his new career path and walked into the cab stand looking for a part-time job. There he would meet the man who would go on to have a tremendous influence on the rest of his life. His name was Paul Vario, and he owned that cab stand along with a few other businesses in the neighborhood. He was a capo regime with the Lucchese crime family, one of the five families of New York, and had his own crew, which included his brothers. In the movie Goodfellas, he was identified as Paul Cicero and was played by Paul Savino. Vario liked the so he made him his gopher who would go on small errands such as buying cigarettes or delivering messages. A while later, the two of them began making the daily rounds together, driving around in Vario's black Impala with him waiting in the car while Henry went out and brought people to him for conversations or collections. By the time he turned 13, Henry was already making more money than he knew how to spend. He had bought his first fancy suit and combed back his dark, slick hair so that from a distance he looked like a mini version of the gangsters that he admired. School didn't present an interest to him anymore. He often skipped class so that he could work Vario or sneak into the racetrack or just hang out at the cab stand. When he turned 14, Henry was presented with a union card and put on the payroll as a bricklayer, even though he didn't actually have to do anything. Most of his weekly salary went to the Varios, of course, but that was the push that finally made him drop out of school altogether. Around that same time, another important figure walked into Henry's life. His name was James Burke, aka Jimmy the Gent, and he was an associate of the Varios who often showed up to the card games. In Hill's own words, Jimmy was already a legend, even though he was only 25 years old at the time. The first time they met, Henry was blown away by the way Jimmy was spreading his cash around. He said that all the other gangsters were pretty cheap. They would tip a dollar every now and then, but they always resented it. Jimmy Burke, on the other hand, was spending hundreds of dollars on tips without a care in the world. Henry saw the doorman get a hundred dollar bill just for opening the door for Jimmy. The barman also got a hundred for keeping the ice cubes cold. Meanwhile, Henry got a five dollar tip every single time he brought Jimmy another beer or a sandwich. Once Jimmy started taking a shine to the kid, those $5 bills turned into 20s. According to Hill, Jimmy Burke was one of the most successful hijackers in the city, specializing in cargo trucks going to and from the airports. He targeted hundreds of trucks a year and earned his nickname of Jimmy the Gent from his habit of putting a $50 bill in the wallet of the driver that he was robbing. At the same time, Hill considered Burke to be a very dangerous and paranoid man who would not hesitate to kill somebody who angered him. He was the type of scary guy that other scary guys were afraid of, but his violence and unpredictability were tolerated because
because he was one of Paul Verio's biggest earners. Just like Henry Hill, Burke had Irish heritage, which meant that he too could never become anything higher than an associate, even though he made a lot of money for the Lucchese crime family. He also was one of the main characters in Goodfellas, where he was named Jimmy Conway and was played by Robert De Niro. Now we'll get into Hill's life of crime in just a sec, but first a quick word from today's video sponsor, NordVPN. So you might have noticed that I now run about 89 YouTube channels, in other words, I'm online a lot, and I talk with people every week who are using the internet with no protection, no VPN like it's the 1990s or something, but VPNs aren't just a more modern way to use the internet, they just make it straight up better, and with NordVPN you can rest easy knowing that your internet use is safely behind a wall of next generation encryption. Block malware and bypass annoying ads that are tracking your web traffic, it's just a much more secure online experience. If you're worried about data logs, don't be, NordVPN doesn't keep logs on your internet use because they know that what you do online is none of their business. What they do do is give you more than 5,000 server options scattered across 59 countries so your IP can live wherever you want it to, and that access can provide you with loads of new options from shopping to streaming. Just one click and you're good to go. So regardless of whether you're considering a VPN for yourself or as a gift for another internet user in your life, NordVPN gives you options. There's never been a better time to enhance your online experience with Nord, so head to nordvpn.com forward slash biographics or use the code biographics at checkout. There's also a link in the description below and let's get back to the video. Hill committed his first serious crime when he was around 15 years old. Somebody had opened a rival cab stand around the corner from the one owned by Barrio and tried to undercut him by lowering prices and offering discounts for special fares. Fixing this problem was left up to Henry, Tully Barrio, Paul's brother, and a drum of gasoline. One night, after everyone at the rival cab stand had left, the two of them went from taxi to taxi. Henry broke the windows with a hammer and Tully shoved gasoline-soaked newspapers inside. Afterwards, Tully backed off to a safe distance and Hill ran from one cab to another throwing matches inside each one of them. The following year, Hill was arrested for the first time, alongside another one of the Barrios, Paul's son Lenny, when the two tried to use a stolen credit card. Henry got roughed up during the interrogation, but he did exactly as he was supposed to do and refused to sign or say anything. He kept quiet during his arraignment as well, and the lawyer on Barrios' payroll got him off on bail. Afterwards, there was a big party in Henry's honor, first at a bar and then at a cab stand to celebrate his first arrest. It seems like Henry's rise within the Barrios' organization was guaranteed, but in 1960, the 17-year-old did something unexpected, which left everyone a bit perplexed. He enlisted in the army, where he would spend the next three years of his life. Why exactly he did this remains a bit uncertain, although he claimed it was due to all the extra attention that the Mafia was receiving from law enforcement at the time. Some even speculated it may have been an attempt to go straight, but if anything, Henry put the skills he had learned from his time at the cab stand to good use. When he started working in the kitchen, he saw that a lot of food was being thrown out because the army always ordered more than necessary. He quickly established a network of restaurants and hotels in the area surrounding Fort Bragg, where he was stationed, and began selling the extra food to them. With the money he made, Hill set up a loan sharking business for the other soldiers and then started hosting guard and dice games. His stint in the army ended in the stockades, serving two months after getting into a drunken brawl with some marines and then stealing a sheriff's car. In 1963, Henry Hill returned to New York and resumed his career as an up-and-coming mobster working for Paul Vario. At first, he was often paired up with Lenny Vario because they were around the same age. However, Paul soon moved Lenny to working as a bartender in a fancy restaurant known as the Azores, which was owned and often frequented by Tommy Lucchese, head of the entire family. That was when Henry started working more often with Jimmy Burke, but as fans of Goodfellas know, there was a third man in the team. In the movie, he was Tommy DeVito, played by Joe Pesci. In real life, he was Tommy DeSimone, the youngest and craziest one of the group. His grandfather and his uncle both served as the heads of the Los Angeles crime family at different times, while his older brothers worked for the Gambino family in New York, so DeSimone had always been around this life. It seemed inevitable that he too would eventually join a crew, and he started working for Paul Vario when he was 15 years old. He'll remember the day he first met Tommy, who was seven years younger than him. Jimmy the Gents brought him around the cab stand. Hill described him as a skinny kid, wearing a wise guy suit and a pencil moustache. Because Jimmy was a friend of the DeSimone family, he wanted Henry to take Tommy under his wing and make him part of the cigarette selling operation that he was handling at the time. The two quickly became friends and partners in a whole bunch of other rackets, such as stealing cars, lending money, committing fraud, and defensing stolen goods. From 
1966, they also started doing hijackings with Jimmy Burke. They were still just street-level wise guys, though, and they needed a big caper if they were to move up in the world. In 1967, this came in the form of a major airport robbery. Just to clarify, this is not the Lufthansa heist depicted in the movie, which came about a decade later. Nope, this was a smaller, much more straightforward job that basically saw Henry and Tommy walk in with an empty suitcase, fill it with money, and walk out without anyone ever realizing it. Once they started working with Burke, the two of them began meeting people who were part of Jimmy's network of informants who tipped him off about good scores. One of them was Bobby McMahon, nicknamed Frenchie, because he had worked for Air France for a long time. He told Hill of a contract that the airline had to bring in US dollars from businesses in Asia and deposit them in American banks. He also told them that the security was pretty lax at the cargo terminal at JFK International, where the money was kept until it was ready for a bank pickup. The biggest obstacles that the crew had to overcome were a locked door and a stubborn security guard who wouldn't take a bribe. They solved these problems by having Frenchie distract the guard one night by taking him to a steam room to meet some girls, which gave them time to steal his key, make a copy, and return the original without the guard noticing. The night of the heist, Henry and Tommy walked into the cargo terminal when the guard was on his meal break. He was carrying the biggest empty suitcase that he could find and entered the storeroom without a problem. They knew what the money bags looked like, white canvas bags with red seals. They crammed seven of them inside Henry's suitcase and simply left the airport without a care in the world, walking away with $420,000. The theft wasn't discovered until the following Monday. In his later years, Henry Hill always proclaims that he had been a money man for the mob and stressed time and time again that he never killed anybody. With that in mind, he also admitted that he saw plenty of people get murdered and that he helped dispose of their bodies. This was not the case with Tommy de Simone, who Henry described as a total psychopath. Hill admitted that he didn't know exactly how many murders de Simone had committed. Him and another mobster named Stanley Diamond killed a union guy in his own home. They were just supposed to rough him up, but Tommy beat him to death out of anger for having to drive all the way to New Jersey and back. On Jimmy's orders, Tommy strangled one of Burke's old partners called Remo with a piano wire out of fear that he was talking to the police. Then there's the notorious scene in Goodfellas where Tommy shoots and kills a kid named Spot during a card game. That one was also real, but the one that ended up sealing Tommy's own fate was the murder of Billy Batts. Real name William Bentvena, Billy Batts was a mobster with the Gambino crime family. In 1970, he had gotten out of prison after a six-year stint and was celebrating his release at a club owned by Jimmy Burke named Robert's Lounge. Tommy DeSimone was 20 years old at the time, and he had been just a kid the last time Billy Batts saw him. Therefore, when Tommy arrived at the club, Batts made some jokes at his expense, asking if he still shined shoes. This made Tommy very very angry, but there was nothing he could do about it. Billy Batts was a made man. He was a full member of the Mafia, which pretty much made him untouchable as far as other mobsters were concerned, unless they received special permission from the boss. The punishment for attacking, let alone killing a made man, would have been death. However, Tommy de Simone was not the most level-headed guy in the world. He kept his temper at the time, but privately he told Henry and Jimmy that he intended to kill Billy Batts. That is exactly what happens, although it wasn't spur of the moment like in the movie. Instead, it took place a few weeks later when Billy Batts was in one of Hill's joints. Jimmy Burke was with him, swapping stories, keeping him happy and drunk. It got late and almost everybody went home. That was when Tommy walked up to Batts and started pummeling him in the head with the butt of his gun while Jimmy held him down. There was an associate of theirs in the club called Alex Corsione. Henry grabbed him and quickly threw him out of the bar to keep him safe, and by the time he had returned, Billy Batts was dead and Tommy was placing him inside a body bag. At least, that's what they thought. While they were driving to get rid of the body, they started hearing noises coming from the trunk. They pulled over, opened the trunk, Tommy smashed him with a shovel, making sure that this time, Billy Batts stayed dead. <laughs> The murder of Bully Bats would have consequences, but not until nearly a decade later. The first half of the 1970s were a quiet period for Henry Hill, mainly because he spent time in prison. In 1972, he was sentenced to 10 years inside Lewisburg Penitentiary for extortion. He only served six, but it was during this time that Hill started dealing drugs since he had the connections to get them smuggled inside the prison. Once he was out, Hill continued trafficking since it was such a lucrative business. Technically, he wasn't supposed to do it since the Lucchese family had banned the drug trade, but if anything, Hill ramped up his operation. He developed 
developed a network of mules. He began handling wholesale quantities, and he also brought Birkin on the business. Soon enough, he was making a lot more money than he had ever made in his criminal career, but his pals were planning something even more audacious. Known as the Lufthansa Heist, it was at the time the largest cash robbery in United States history. On December the 11th, 1978, criminals made off with $5 million in cash plus another million in jewelry stolen from the Lufthansa cargo terminal at JFK International Airport. Almost none of it was ever recovered, and despite a massive FBI investigation, the only person ever convicted was a small-time player named Louis Verner, who served as the inside man. Unlike the Air France heist, Henry Hill had almost no involvement in this one, other than receiving the tip and passing it along to Jimmy the Gent. Although he was never charged for it, Burke was the one identified as the mastermind of the whole thing. Ultimately, it may have been a good thing for Hill that he stayed out of this heist, because soon after it happened, a lot of people supposedly involved in it started dropping dead. It began with Parnell Stacks Edwards, who drove a black Ford van which served as the getaway car. He was supposed to have it destroyed at a junkyard, but instead he drove it to his girlfriend's apartment where he parked it in front of a fire hydrant. The police found it two days later and recovered multiple sets of fingerprints from inside the van. Just a week after the heist, Edwards was shot and killed in his apartment. The following month came the death of Martin Krugman, the guy who originally had the tip about the heist. By the summer of 1979, eight people associated with the robbery were either dead or missing. Most people, Hill included, regarded this as Jimmy Burke cleaning house after Edwards Edwards' screw-up since he knew the police were on their trail. However, Hill also speculated that Jimmy may have intended to do this from the very beginning in order to increase his share of the profits. Another person who disappeared around this time was Tommy DeSimone. Although he probably took part in the Lufthansa heist, nobody thought this was the work of Jimmy Burke. Instead, it was believed that this was revenge for the murder of Billy Batts nine years earlier, although who exactly was responsible remains a mystery to this day. Hill always maintains that it was John Gotti himself, the future head of the Gambino crime family, who killed Tommy, although he did change some of the story details over the years. Other culprits have been put forward, but there is no definitive answer as to Simone's body has never been found. Hill couldn't help but notice that all the people around him were dropping like flies. He was realistic. He understood that under the right circumstances, all of his past history with guys like Burke or Paul Vario would mean little. They would bump him off in a heartbeat in order to protect themselves. Those circumstances occurred in 1980, when Hill was arrested for drug trafficking. By this point, he was an alcoholic and a coke addict, but was still clear-headed enough to realize that his arrest gave his mobster buddies a strong reason to want him dead. In fact, the FBI even played him a tape where two of his associates, named Anthony Stabile and Angelo Serpe, were talking about getting rid of Hill because he was a no-good junkie. But it wasn't until the feds got Burke on tape talking with Paul Vario about killing Hill that he finally understood that his days were numbered. He only had one choice, testify against his former colleagues and receive witness protection. Hill's testimony helped secure 50 convictions. Both Jimmy Burke and Paul Vario were imprisoned on various counts and died there. After the trials were over, Henry Hill took his wife Karen and their two children and entered the witness protection program. They moved around the country from city to city, sometimes leaving their old life behind with just a few hours notice. This was the point where the movie ended, but in real life, Henry Hill never proved able to walk the straight and narrow. In the early 90s, he was kicked out of the program after several new arrests on drug charges. Around that same time, his wife divorced him, and after over a decade of using multiple aliases, Henry Hill started using his own name again. He felt that everyone from his past life who may have wanted to hurt him was either dead or in prison. Not to mention that by this point, Goodfellas had been released, and Hill was keen to enjoy his newfound fame. He gave interviews, wrote new books, appeared on The Howard Stern Show, he even sold his own line of spaghetti sauce. He also kept getting in trouble with the law, with the last arrest occurring in 2009. Hill died three years later, aged 69, following a heart attack, securing for himself a permanent and unique place in the annals of crime. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.